And welcome. Uh, welcome for the people here at SPY25 and welcome to the people watching online. Um, I am super happy that you're all here on this very rainy day and that you all made it. Um, welcome to today's NIAS talk, Women's Voices from the Mediterranean, um, where we will explore communication and language in the Mediterranean from the pre-modern era to today. Um, my name is Zara Kars, I am public historian and a program maker at NIAS. And before I tell a little bit more about the program, let me briefly uh, explain a little bit about the NIAS talks. Um, this is a monthly series organized by the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study and we are a research institute where scholars from all over the world come together with writers, journalists and artists to explore curiosity-driven, state-of-the-art, uh, exciting topics within humanities and the social sciences. Um, and today's talk is, I think, an example of what research as NIAS can be about and how that really comes together with our fellows and writers. Um, because we will shed light on the question, what insight women's experience and their use of language can add to our understanding of uh, the Mediterranean. And um, when I was working on the program, I was really thinking what defines using your voice. Um, for some, it's really the freedom to speak your mind um, or to be able to, to translate your thoughts in different languages. Um, and I can imagine that as a historian I was thinking about before, um, that it was quite different in ages before social media than now. Um, um, so how did that work in the Mediterranean? How did multilingualism work and how were women's experiences? Well, we'll discuss all this with four wonderful speakers. Uh, writers and historians. Um, I'm here today with Eric Dursteler, Maartje van Gelder, Nisreen Mbarki and Lamia Makadam. I'll um, introduce them a bit more thorough when they come on stage. Uh, but first I want to start with Lamia, I think. Um, Lamia will do spoken words. Afterwards, Eric will briefly sketch a context on his research at NIAS and then me, uh, Maartje and Nisreen will join him on stage to discuss it further. You are all very welcome to ask questions, to engage in the discussion. Um, there will be someone from SPY walking around so don't uh, hesitate and don't be shy. And if there's anything you don't understand from the terms that uh, any of us is using, also, don't uh, be shy to raise your hand uh, and ask for clarification. If you want to ask a question in Dutch, also don't hesitate. We'll try to uh, translate. Lamia, can I give you the floor? Good uh, afternoon. My name is Lamia Makadam and I come from Den Haag. My name is Lamia Makadam. I am from The Hague. Fustenon Kassieron. إذا منعتني من ارتداء فستان قصير ماذا سيبقى لنسعى من أجله ترى ركبتي النافرتين إغواء ولا ترى ما في القدمين من محبة أتعرف أني صنعت هاتين الركبتين من علب صفيح قديمة وعصي تركها أبي معلقة على جدران غرفته ركبتي لأسباب كهذه لا تغريان أحدا عندما جريت وعندما سقطت عندما أحببت وعندما بكيت حضمت ركبتي كقطع 
ممزقة من قلب صغير ومرة أكلت ركبة اليسرى وأنا أشاهد فيلم الجوع واقفة على قدم واحدة وظهري مسند للجدار لو أنك نظرت جيدا لما رأيت في ركبتي ما يغري ولا طلبت مني أن أعري كتفي أيضا وصدري أن أمشي معك في الشارع عارية كورقة غار ليس الجسد ما يظهر للبشر الجسد فكرة لو نظرت جيدا لتركتني أزين ركبتي بأشرطة ملونة أجرهما خلفي في الملاهي أمنحهما من حين لآخر قطعة حلوى وأضع وأصرخ حين تتشاقيان أو تخبطان في بركة ماء آخر النهار أربطهما بحبل في رقبتي وأعود زحفا على عروقي أنت على حق الحب رحلة شاقة زحف دائم باتجاه الآخر إذا مددت يدك الآن ولمست الجلد الناعم ستجد حجيرين يتيمين ينشران البؤس Kort rokje. Wanneer je mij verbiedt om een kort rokje te dragen, wat blijft er dan nog over om voor te vechten? Mijn knieën vind je wel verleidelijk. Mijn voeten vertederen je niet. Weet je dan niet dat ik de knieën van lege oude blikjes heb gemaakt? En van de wandelstokken die mijn vader in zijn kamer had hangen? Om die reden kunnen mijn knieën helemaal niet iemand verleiden. Toen ik rende en viel, toen ik lief had en huilde, omhelste ik ze alsof ze van stukjes gebroken hart waren gemaakt. Eén keer at ik van mijn linkerknie, kijkend naar de film Hanger, staande op één been met mijn, met mijn rug tegen de muur. Als je echt kijkt, zal je niets verleidelijks aan mijn knie zien. Je zult aan mij vragen om mijn schouder en borsten aan je te laten zien. Naakt als een laurierblad loop ik met jou door de straten. De mensen zien mijn lichaam niet. Het lichaam is een idee. Als je goed kijkt, zie je dat mijn knieën versierd zijn met kleurige linten. Af en toe voer ik, voer ik mijn knieën snoepjes. Ik schreeuw wanneer ze in het koude water springen. Aan het einde van de dag knoop ik ze met een touw om mijn hals en kruip ik terug. Op mijn aderen. Je hebt gelijk. De liefde is, is een zware reis. Onafgebroken kruipen naar de ander waar maar geen eind aankomt. 
als je je hand uitsteekt en de zachte huid van mijn knieën voelt, zul je twee verweeste stenen ontdekken die veel verdriet verspreiden. Dank u wel. Thanks, Lamia. And I realized as I was walking down that I did not introduce you properly, so I will do so now. Lamia is a poet, a translator, and a journalist. She published three books of poetry in Arabic, if I'm right. Um, and one of them is Je zult me vinden in elk woord dat ik schrijf, which uh, was translated from Arabic uh, in a collaborative effort with Abdelkader Benali. Um, Makadam also translates to Arabic, uh, for example, uh, novels by Connie Palme, if I'm right, and I found out also the novel Malva, which was written by Hagar Peters, our former writer in residence at NIAS. Um, thank you very much, that was wonderful. Then our next speaker is Eric Dursteler, professor of history at Brigham Young University. Um, his research focuses on the entangled history of the early modern Mediterranean, in particular gender, language, food and identity. And as you might have guessed, he's currently fellow at NIAS. Um, and during his fellowship, he's really working on a research project on the pre-modern Mediterranean and women's experiences of language, communication and multilingualism. He will be able to, to uh, uh, explain all of this much better than I do. So, Eric, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It took us a little while to, uh, to make this happen with, uh, with COVID and other uh, complications. So it's, a, it's a, a special pleasure to be able to finally be together. And I appreciate uh, both the invitation uh, and those uh, who have, uh, per are participating with me for taking time um, out, of their, uh, out of their schedules. Um, and I'm happy to be able to tell you a little bit about uh, the research um, uh, that I'm doing at, uh, at NIAS uh, and to have a conversation about uh, some, of the, some of the ideas um, uh, that, we, um, that we're working on together. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, maybe the, uh, the topic that I'm working on and some of the, the ideas um, through uh, doing what historians do, and which is telling stories. So uh, I'd like to tell you a story, um, not about this man, because we don't have a, an actual image of, uh, of the man that I want to talk to you about, um, but I bet he probably looked something like this. Um, so I'd like to start with a vignette from uh, this region here, the Dalmatian coast of what is today modern day Croatia. Um, and uh, in 1553, uh, two Venet Venetian patricians, Juan Battista Justinian and Antonio Diedo, were sent um, to this region on a mission to gather information. Uh, as you can see from this map, certain areas of this coast were ruled over by Venice. And so um, uh, Justinian and Diedo returned from their about six month mission and gave a report to the Venetian Senate on what they had seen, what they had discovered. And they talk about society and they write about uh, trade, they write about religion, uh, military affairs, but interestingly, they also have a great deal to say um, about language. Um, and so, for example, in the coastal town of Sebenico, um, Justinian, uh, in his report, uh, says that the language and customs of this region are, quote, Slavic, but, quote, almost all the men also speak Italian. As for the city's women, however, he says almost none knows how to speak Italian. In the important trading center of Spalato, uh, or Split, uh, he says all the men of that city speak Italian, uh, but he again underscores the fact that, quote, the women do not speak anything but their maternal tongue. 
Justinian, Justinian's view of uh, gendered monolingualism uh, was not uncommon. Many early modern uh, observers contended that this was, in fact, a woman's natural state. Many contemporaries had serious doubts about the utility of women even studying languages and even their intellectual capacity uh, to learn them. For instance, uh, Thomas Salter warned that linguistic knowledge would give women access to dangerous and lascivious knowledge uh, that would injure their morals and make them bold disputers who might dare to undercut uh, male privilege. To contextualize these views, and there are many, many, many other examples of these views about women and language and learning in general. I've just shared one with you. But to contextualize these a bit, I think we should revisit Justinian, who's visited the, uh, the Dalmatian coast. Um, discussing this small town of Trau or Trogir, he provides uh, some additional insight into why he believes women are monolingual. He says, Everyone speaks Italian, but in their homes, they speak the Slavic language out of respect for the women because few of them understand the Italian language. And even if some woman understands it, she does not want to speak anything but her maternal tongue. There's that language again, the maternal uh, mother language. In contrast to Dalmatian men, uh, he says, whose political, economic, and social activities exposed them to, quote, the continual presence of foreigners who dock their ships that sail in the Levant and the Ponente, east and west. Um, he says, women's linguistic limitations were a byproduct of their domesticity. Of course, the nation, uh, notion of a male, public, female, private sort of space and the dichotomy of these two spaces has been around for a long time, has been roundly and correctly criticized by generations of scholars who've shown that, in fact, uh, the reality is a much more complex and blurred uh, reality than these prescriptive um, theories and texts um, allow. Whatever its composition and confines, and I'm not, um, I mean, we could talk about that, but that's not my, my uh, interest today. Uh, I think that um, for my topic, domestic spaces, so-called, uh, are essential to understanding uh, multilingualism in the Mediterranean, both uh, among women and men. While men may have experienced the sea's great linguistic diversity uh, more commonly uh, in certain types of political or religious uh, or economic arenas, um, most of which, to, uh, we have to say, were not inaccessible to women uh, either, um, uh, their wives, their sisters, their mothers, their daughters often, but not only, I would say, did so in more uh, domestic sorts of spaces. Though, as we can uh, talk about, these were also extremely important spaces for, uh, for men's uh, linguistic mixing as well. So I think what we need to do is reconceptualize our notions of domestic space and their significance in terms of, of language learning. So I think Justinian uh, and other observers uh, erase women's voices because they are, to paraphrase an American song from the 1980s that you probably don't know, but is embedded in my mind, as, as songs often are, I think they're looking for language in all the wrong places. Uh, I'd like to challenge Justinian's depiction in my own research by looking uh, at some of the right places. Um, domestic spaces were clearly uh, an important locus, uh, perhaps the key locus for women's linguistic uh, lives uh, and not a barrier to uh, mu their multilingualism. Settings important in every stage of women's lives, including homes, baths, marital beds, nurseries, markets, workshops, convents, infirmaries, brothels, uh, all of these uh, served as areas in which women were not isolated from, but were in fact ling uh, exposed to linguistic variety. Uh, and indeed, these are spaces in which women educated other women um, in language. Um, two confessions before I uh, begin giving a few examples. First, uh, I have to acknowledge the impressionistic nature of my evidence. I'm, I'm going to roam sort of very widely. Um, uh, and this is a result in no small part uh, of the silences of archives and the challenges of hearing, uh, discovering women's voices, um, which is something perhaps we can talk about a little bit more later. 
I, second, I also just want to acknowledge the influence on my thinking of, uh, of other scholars, sociolinguists, and this is some, one of the sort of exciting things about a place like NEOS, is it brings together people from all sorts of different um, backgrounds and puts us literally at a, a lunch table and invites us to have uh, conversations. And so my work on, uh, on this has been influenced by uh, other scholars um, working on gender and language. And contemporary uh, linguists initially uh, argued uh, that women were uh, a muted group, uh, that they were inferior language uh, users because of uh, either their subordinate social status, which is kind of the, the deficit uh, model, uh, or uh, what were attributed to, uh, or women's uh, perceived linguistic deficiencies were attributed to male domination uh, and female uh, oppression um, in social discourse, the, the dominance uh, model. In the case of gender and multilingualism, uh, in an argument that paralleled Justinian, linguists uh, have contended that men acquired language skills, acquire language skills in work settings outside the home, while women remain largely monolingual because of their role in preserving and safeguarding the maternal culture and language within the confines of domestic space. So this was, these were sort of some of the models of, of earlier generations of scholars of language and, um, and, um, uh, and gender. Um, more recently, uh, scholars uh, have uh, begin to fa find it, that exactly the opposite of this is true, that like that whole f uh, scholarship was kind of wrong uh, in, in many ways. Um, it is often um, contemporary uh, linguists have found women who instigate ling language shift within their families and within their communities uh, because of the role that they fill um, as cultural brokers through uh, mixed marriages, through friendship, um, through child rearing, uh, domestic service, other forms of work, uh, women may in fact be more sensitive to and more aware of the demands of the linguistic marketplace than men, and thus more exposed to and accomplished at multilingual communication than men. Rather than preserving the maternal tongue, in some contemporary contexts, women embrace the dominant language in an effort to improve opportunities for their children um, or their selves. It's common for uh, women, particularly younger women, to embrace a new language in hopes of greater social mobility uh, through improved professional opportunities or favorable social uh, relationships. Linguists have in fact identified multi what they call multilingual couple talk and cross-linguistic intimacy as important catalysts for women's language um, acquisition. And I think that this contemporary research uh, provides some useful ways to thinking about what I'm interested in, which is four or five hundred years ago, uh, and how these things worked in the, um, in the Mediterranean. And so, for example, uh, linguistically blended households were extremely common in this time period in what was an, a very mobile sort of a space. The Mediterranean is a very connected uh, and entangled sort of a space. And so on the island of Malta, for example, um, after the arrival of the Knights Hospitaller in 1530, the island's population explodes. And many um, uh, non-Maltese uh, men settle on the island and they begin intermarrying um, with local women. Um, there is good evidence of mixed uh, marriages by Maltese women with Greek uh, sailors and Spanish uh, expatriates in Malta, uh, but also of Italian and Greek women marrying uh, men from Malta and elsewhere. And this has this really interesting sort of uh, impact on language. Uh, Maltese began to be uh, mingled with Italian in a local form of kind of a lingua franca, um, and Italian became kind of the dominant cultural and administrative uh, language among a, a, a multilingual elite on Malta. But it's not just the elite. Among Maltese townswomen, one a contemporary observer noted, quote, almost all speak Italian. In a Genoese sing-song, mixed with the occasional, what this observer calls barbarian, by which he means Maltese uh, word. Um, this gives rise to very common situations such that, as that of a, the Maltese woman uh, Minichella de Patti, uh, who used Italian to communicate with her French husband. Um, and I'm just giving you know, very brief examples. Uh, there are many, many more we could look at, but uh, just to look at another sort of an example, I think slavery is actually an important uh, space for understanding women's multilingualism as well. 
between 1500 and 1800, between three and five million people were enslaved in the Mediterranean, with a two to one ratio of Christians to Muslims and the same of men uh, to women. Women slaves in the Mediterranean were primarily earmarked for household service as wet nurses, laundresses, maids, cooks, um, and this puts them in incredibly intimate um, positions in relationship to uh, their Christian or Jewish or Muslim owners. Uh, thus, it's very common for them to be integrated into the household. Um, one uh, scholar has described this as being swallowed up by the families of their owners. Um, and this heightens, of course, their exposure and their need to learn the language uh, of their owners. A contemporary slave narrative from this time period um, shows how this works. A Spanish slave named Catarina fled from Algiers with a lover and went to live among Arab uh, tribes in the interior. Both of them spoke Arabic, quote, very well, but especially the woman, um, it's said. And, uh, and then the reporter goes on to say, this is a common thing among all Christian women captives. The reason for this is that their mistresses learn the Spanish language from them and in the same way, the Christian women very easily learn the Moorish or Arabic language from their mistresses. In fact, sometimes this language acquisition uh, is intentional. Some Jewish slave owners, for example, in Istanbul, trained their slaves in the, uh, in, in the Turkish language and in singing, playing of musical instruments, dancing, and other necessary skills because that added prestige to the household and, and value to the slaves. Uh, another uh, important multilingual context uh, is that of uh, sex work, prostitution. And in Rome, for example, prostitution was characterized by intense intercultural mixing with both, both prostitutes and their clients coming from throughout Europe and the Mediterranean. A character in uh, Francisco Delicado's El Retrato de, Losa de la Lozana Andaluza uh, declares that Rome's prostitutes come from todas naciones, all lands. And then he reels off a list of almost 70 cities, regions, and countries from which these women uh, hail. The men who frequent these women uh, are a similarly diverse group from all over the map. Uh, the locales of these encounters were spaces in which not just sex, but food, information, gossip, recipes, remedies, money, goods uh, were exchanged. Uh, and uh, in order to communicate uh, with her diverse clientele, co-workers and neighbors, Lozana writes, uh, wrote that it was necessary, quote, to tailor my speech to the sound of my ears. These exchanges were not accomplished, she says, in a perfect Castilian, which is her language, uh, but rather um, what she calls a mixed speech, uh, what I would call maybe a, a prostitute patois um, that incorporated Spanish, Catalan, Portuguese, Italian, and even, uh, and even Arabic. Uh, in counterpart to the profane locales of prostitution, convents were also interestingly highly multilingual spaces because they housed women from diverse backgrounds. Uh, in the exiled English convents in France and the Low Countries, for example, multilingual nuns were sought after as interpreters among the sisters, their monolingual confessors and patrons, and with suppliers and laborers from the surrounding communities. They played a very important role. Within the convent walls, nuns taught each other uh, languages. Uh, they petitioned to be given language instruction. Uh, and in some uh, instances, they were obliged to dedicate uh, time uh, each day to language study. Young girls were sent by uh, their parents to learn languages. And promising novices were dispatched to other convents to refine their language skills. Uh, and it's not just the nuns, but also local lay sisters from the community who uh, enter into the convent um, also served as intermediaries, both uh, um, to the local communities, but they also themselves then begin learning, in this case, English in these, uh, in these, um, uh, these uh, English convents. Of course, we know that uh, early modern women were not confi confined to private spaces. They moved about quite freely, as I said before. Many engaged in, uh, in public economic activities. Uh, for example, in France, Spanish immigrant women were more actively involved in commerce uh, because they had better uh, linguistic skills than, their, uh, than Portuguese women um, in the same communities. Uh, and the Spanish command of their French language gave them an advantage and made them more desirable um, on the uh, on the market. 
Um, many slave women, if they're not in household service, uh, became spinners or embroiderers. They produced foodstuffs, uh, worked in uh, workshops in the fields, and this, again, placed them in a, a plurilingual situations in which they had to find ways to navigate um, these differences. Boccaccio's story of Gostanza from the Decameron, I think, maybe is a good example here. Mad with desperation uh, over a lost love, uh, Gostanza casts herself into a small boat, which you can see up there, uh, from her home in uh, north of Sicily, Sicily, and she is eventually washed ashore um, in Tunisia. She's received into the household of an Arab woman, uh, where she lives, quote, with several other women without any men and all worked with their hands at various crafts. This is Boccaccio's language that I'm sharing here, making items of silk, palm fiber, and uh, leather. Uh, working as alongside these uh, older a Arab women, Gostanza soon learned all these skills, and quote, with them teaching her, uh, she quickly learned the language. I think another example, um, a little closer to home maybe, uh, and I'll conclude with this example, that problematizes this public-private dichotomy uh, is that of the wives of ambassadors who accompanied their husbands to the Mediterranean. They played informal but critical roles as intermediaries, patrons, negotiators, alliance builders, and information brokers. Drawing on their uh, unique social networks, they uh, used formal visits, informal encounters, hospitality, gifts giving, um, which uh, gave them sort of unique sources of information and influence that were una unavailable to men. So rather than being a barrier, their sex and status uh, actually was a passport that granted them access and influence in places that men could never uh, go. And this is evident in the case of Clara Caterina de Hochepie, daughter of the Dutch ambassador in Istanbul, Justinius Collier. The uh, artist Cornelis uh, de Braun uh, describes watching an Ottoman procession with young Clara and her father in 1698. He says, as they're returning home, a disagreement arose with some of the ambassador's servants and the servants of an Ottoman official. And they actually start fighting in the street and they get, break metal off of uh, buildings and start beating each other with, the, with this. And so the situation escalates. And then according to de Brown, Clara, quote, who understands the Turkish language very well and was dressed in the Turkish way, intervened with amicable words. And she effectively diffuses the situation. She's 18 years old, just so you know, in the midst of, uh, of all of this. And she calms these you know, men going wild in the street uh, of Istanbul. Several years later, uh, when her brother, Jakobus Collier, uh, becomes the ambassador, uh, she visited him in Ederna uh, and, quote, had a most remarkable meeting. And we know of this because it's so remarkable that ja Jakobus um, has to give credit to her, which is not often the case with ambassadors. They like to take credit. Um, uh, he says that Clara... Um, and uh, was uh, riding about in a carriage and encountered this woman here, Sultan Mustafa II's mother, as well as his first uh, and most beloved wife. And the two carriages pull up uh, beside each other. The, the imperial woman gestured to Clara to come closer. Uh, and he says, quote, they had a long conversation. Remember, she speaks great Turkish. Uh, Collier reported that when the women uh, departed, the Ottoman women departed, quote, my sister and her company were presented with exquisitely embroidered handkerchiefs full of golden ducats. Uh, it is an event, he says, never heard of before, the most signal honor ever shown to anyone in this country, for these empresses never appear in public, let alone that they would talk to anyone. What he means is that they won't talk to him. <laughs> but they do talk with each other all the time. Um, uh, these connections in the imperial harem end up being very useful for Clara, who, uh, who fulfills really kind of an informal diplomatic uh, role for decades in the reason. Uh, one traveler says she um, has, knows 10 different languages. You know, she's just a, a polyglot. Um, <clears throat> So I, I probably need to conclude. Time is running. So uh, let, me, let me just conclude with this. So I think these examples, I hope these examples um, give us a sense of sort of the culturally um, dynamic space of the Mediterranean and the way that linguistic mi mixing works in this place. Um, uh, I think uh, that in this context, linguistic difference is not disorienting or confusing. Though these people may not have been able to pass a language test like we have to take today, they developed skills for communicating um, um, with both verbal and non-verbal uh, techniques. 
uh, because their primary objective is effective communication, not passing a test. That's not useful. Uh, so in these settings, necessity is the mother of all communication. Language functions as a tool for getting things done. Um, and competence, rather than linguistic virtuosity, is the order of the day. Sociolinguists call this ordinary language. It's not the sort of speech that you have when you go to the court or to the church or something like that, but it's the sort of speech that happens in the streets of, uh, of, of communities um, everywhere. I think the, uh, uh, the view on language and gender of a woman might help us to understand this a little better. Um, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, the uh, very famous wife of an English ambassador uh, in Istanbul, um, described uh, in her, one of her letters home the crazy composition of her household. And you can see this quote here. She says, I live in a place that very well represents the Tower of Babel. In Para, where she lived, they speak Turkish, Greek, Hebrew, Armenian, and she goes on and on. Uh, and she says, what's worse, there is 10 of these languages spoken in my house. My grooms are Arabs, my footmen French, English and German, my nurses and Armenian, my housemaid Russians. And she goes on again and describes all of these uh, different languages that are spoken in her household. She says, this medley of sounds had an extraordinary effect upon the people that are born here. She says, both women and men learned, quote, all these languages at the same time and without knowing any of them well enough to write or read in it. Again, that notion of language to get stuff done. Uh, I think in the end, she's the better observer. I think that she uh, is at least more astute when talking about women and their uh, experiences because she has access to those experiences and experiences them as well. And so she understands that the domestic spaces, so-called, if women do in fact only inhabit those spaces, that those are not limiting but expanding uh, and spaces in which language is incredibly important um, rather than unimportant. So Justinian doesn't know that because he doesn't go into those spaces. He makes assumptions uh, that uh, are incorrect. Uh, and women's experiences, I hope we've seen, run kind of the gamut from diplomacy to slavery to, um, to you know, um, domestic sort of um, tasks and so forth. And so I, I hope what is clear from this uh, very brief survey is that in the Mediterranean uh, uh, world that women could actually speak languages. So that's my simple conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Um, I want to ask Nisreen and Martje uh, to uh, join us on stage. I think, I mean, there's lots to discuss, and I, I saw you both writing a bit as well, but I think, uh, Martje, can I uh, ask you to respond to Eric first? And uh, I mean, I can imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, you as a historian also have to deal with silence in the archive. So I'm, I am curious to hear, hear more about that. But. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Lamia, uh, for your um, contribution. And thanks, Eric, for your um, thought-provoking talk and for introducing the Mediterranean as a, an actor almost. We, I think we can hear the sea speak in all its different uh, dimensions. Um, so there's lots of um, themes I would like to explore or discuss with you. Um, definitely the spaces that you mentioned and the relationship between gender and space, as you highlighted, that's something that historians and social scientists have been um, discussing for a long, long time. I'm also really intrigued by the way you use uh, social linguistics. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a bit more about how theory um, and concepts from that area can help us as historians in making sense of the past and in getting um, the silences to speak, as it were. Um, but I would like to go to start off with, um, as Sarah highlighted, with the idea of silences in the archive. So it is um, a concept that um, social historians have wrestled with, basically, um, for those who would like to know what the poor, the migrants, uh, the peasants, and uh, uh, any other marginal category, marginal between scare quotes, um, had to say, uh, we run up against these silences, basically. And even if the archival documents from past centuries reflect voices, then it's always through at least one 
very often more filters. And so I was thinking also about the ways in which uh, post-colonial studies and subaltern studies have learned us to deal with um, the archive not as a neutral repository of information, but as very much a construction um, conditioned basically by power differences and different hierarchies. Um, information, as we all know, um, is ordered, categorized, repressed, erased, and that idea or that theme of erasure um, was very present, of course, in your talk, but also I, I, it made me wonder whether Justinian is, as you said, a less astute observer, or rather, perhaps as I was thinking, an observer who has uh, a point to make about the masculinity of his own observations and about his own work, perhaps. And so I would like to draw you out a bit more on that uh, tension, you might say, between the power in the archive, the silences that we come across in the different records, and how you wrestle with them. Yeah, uh, Eric, do you want to respond? I can respond. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for these, uh, these uh, thought-provoking um, uh, observations. I, I think that you're, I'll start sort of at the la end and try to wander my way back and you can get me back on course if I, if I don't. Um, I think uh, that you're absolutely right uh, about uh, Justinian. Uh, certainly part of what's operative here is that he doesn't have access to or perhaps doesn't choose to access um, these, uh, these uh, spaces. Uh, I think it's also not something that he is, well, he's interested because he makes a, a commentary about this, but he doesn't seem to be interested uh, beyond, uh, in, in going beyond sort of a, a, certain, a certain level. And so, you know, whether there is a, as you suggest, sort of a, a, a motivation uh, behind that, an intentionality, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's uh, an, interesting, uh, uh, an interesting thought. Um, there certainly is a um, operative, um, especially among um, Venetian, but also Dalma Dalmatian elites in this t time period, certain attitudes uh, about appropriate um, female behavior and where uh, women um, should be, sort of what, what their space is. Those are prescriptive, probably more uh, than descriptive in most instances. If, if anything, they may be descriptive of a very sort of small elite sort of experience. Um, and one of the things that I uh, have wanted to do with this project is to sort of move beyond that, that level. There is a rich, as you know, scholarship on, on uh, literate women now, um, and women's uh, writing, um, women as translators um, in this time period. Uh, what's harder, and sort of where the silences of the archives, intentional or, or not, um, challenge us, challenge uh, historians, is getting to the level that interests me, which is the port um, and on the ships that are crossing the water uh, and in the enclosed uh, spaces um, that, uh, that are not described or are only described sort of in indirectly because men e either cannot access those spaces or choose not to access those, access those spaces or prefer to describe a certain reality that may or may not, or a certain vision of what perhaps they would uh, hope a reality might, uh, might be. So, um, you know, literacy is very limited in this time period as well, not just for women, but for men, and so, it is, uh, it is um, sort of a search for needles in the haystack, really, to try to recreate or, or even just capture examples that hint at, uh, at this sort of more complex reality. So that's sort of methodologically, that's how I've approached this. The, there are not, these are not sources by women about their own experiences. They are filtered through the lens of other observers who usually are uninterested uh, or dismissive of these experiences, but only in certain instances, like when an 18-year-old girl sort of shouts down a crowd of fighting men, that's something that is interesting, right, that would be reported. So, 
So I, I, my assumption is that behind these cases is, is a much, much richer reality that we just get sort of little bubbles that pop to the surface because of the silence of the, of the archives. Yeah, it's of course highly um, thematic that we have to juggle a microphone to make ourselves uh, <laughs> <laughs> need to share one. <laughs> it's also good for collective uh, or for communal um, I'll try uh, not ties. to monopolize. That. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> We're the majority. <laughs> yeah. um, no, because I was also thinking uh, to return to the theme of uh, spaces, and, uh, and obviously um, when we have to piece together all these experiences in the past, we very often gravitate to the city because it at least allows us uh, a more dense... Um, treasure trove, you might say, of archival records, uh, even though they're very, um, um, you know, they pose their own difficulties that we have to navigate. But I was thinking not so much of the brothel and the convent, uh, the ones you highlighted, but also of um, all the uh, infrastructure that has to do with migration and with mobility. Um, and it seems to me that uh, given at least for, for many Italian cities and absolutely for Venice, the, um, the enormous number of women owning or running inns, lodges, um, all sorts of taverns, etc., that those might be a way to get around, if we look at them and we look at the clientele, which is uh, inherently uh, international, that we might not hear these women uh, speak as they must have done on a daily uh, basis, but at least we can glean um, how they operated in such a multilingual, uh, multilinguistic um, landscape. So I was wondering, and I might hand it back, or I might just, um, uh, I think I'll gather some more thoughts and then I'll hand it over to you. So, but I was wondering whether those uh, spaces also form part of your research. And I'm thinking of works by colleagues such as Rosa Salzberg, of course. Um, the one thing that really interested me, but that it's a classical case of not really having a question, just being um, intrigued, is um, food, which you mentioned, and also in the um, the cheap uh, print woodcut you showed of uh, Lozana, I think it was, you see many different elements that have to do uh, with cooking. Um, and I was wondering whether recipes and the exchange or the, the mixing of different mm. cuisines, whether that's also a way in which you make um, silent women speak, as it were. Um, and ultimately, but this, you know, that's another typical sin of the historian. This goes to my own uh, interest. Um, I'm really interested in, in forms of protest and, um, and revolts, and already those types of actions get repressed in the archive. Um, the idea of rebellious women is something that in the early modern era, at least for the prescriptive uh, elements of what you were supposed to be, how you were supposed to behave. The idea of rebellious women obviously doesn't figure into it. But at the same time, when we see women protest collectively, uh, the, um, they are in, in the records, the historical records, uh, talked about as if they only um, come together when there's food involved or rather scarcity. So food <laughs> scarcity, that's something that women given the maternal dimension of that, uh, of that uh, subject, can protest. Anything more political, they cannot. And it's actually always struck me how eagerly male historians have um, taken this view as well. So I, I was wondering whether you've come across rebellious women in your research. <laughs> A, a brief response, because I'm yeah. also, yeah, but do, do respond. Uh, I'm also very curious about uh, Nisreen's remarks. Okay. Yeah. Um, I will be uh, brief, and you can nudge <laughs> me, because I'm not yeah, normally yes. brief, as you've seen. Uh, so food is very interesting to me on many levels, and, and one of the avenues that I'm hoping to take this research mm -hmm. is precisely into the tavernas and spaces, travelers, uh, inhabit because I think those, as you say, are quintessential sort of mix, ling, spaces of linguistic mixing. So I have not gone there, but I think if I can get into those spaces, that there could be some interesting uh, information um, from them. Uh, and um, there are um, examples of recipes, uh, both um, in kind of an early modern sense, which is uh, from medical sorts of 
of um, concoctions uh, that, uh, that do circulate in this time period, uh, but also uh, increasingly um, for cooking um, uh, as well. And there is sort of an in interesting kind of m mixing among travelers or diplomatic women who are sometimes collecting these um, as part of, uh, part of their uh, travels as well. Uh, I wrote a book about renegade women, not quite rebellious women, but they're rebellious in, 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 their, in their own way. That hasn't been a part um, of, of this research, um, except in sort of the, the few ways in which I know <clears throat> about these women who use sort of boundaries and, um, and the spaces of the Mediterranean to assert a certain agency in their own lives that, that puts them into these sorts of situations that I'm talking about. The, in fact, the original idea for this came from these women and sort of moving from Venice to Istanbul or from, um, Dalmatia, from Dalmatia to Venice and kind of having to navigate these linguistic realities. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I'll, I'm curious because you, I do want to ask one question already, and you don't have to respond yet. But okay. just keep it in mind because you just mentioned that some of these we, women collected recipes, if I'm right. But was it then an oral tradition, or did they write it down? Because you also mentioned that not all of them were able to. Right. Uh, well, that's for for later. Um, first, uh, Nisreen, writer, translator, poet. Um, I'm curious. Uh, you wrote you wrote a very nice book of poetry. It's called Overloos, or in Dutch, you, in Dutch you say Overloos. In English, you would say Endless. I think the translation is. Or yeah, we we still didn't figure that out. <laughs> Because I love this word because of its double meaning. So uh, this is the first problem you get when you translate. I would love to keep both meanings and actually the other meaning is without um, banks. And I love bankless, but it's not a real English word. So we are still looking for, but there is no English translation yet, so no official one. Um, I was wondering very uh, specifically, Eric said in, in the end of his presentation, language was used as a tool for getting things done. Um, and I mean, you wrote this book of poetry uh, and it is multilingual. How do you look or reflect on this idea of language as, as a tool for getting things done. Do you think of language the same way? Well, actually, I'm the living example of, um, how did you call that, um, the, the necessity of learning language in a domestic space. But in, in, these, in this time, so while I was listening to you, I, I actually I compared that period with this period in the Mediterranean, and I was a little bit struck by the fact that it's still very comparable. And um, just to, to give, uh, to illustrate the fact that I'm the living example, so what happened to me, how I became multilingual is that I, I, I was born here and I spoke Dutch as my first language and uh, Moroccan Arabic, Darija with my parents and then at a certain age uh, I went to the Mediterranean to live with my grandmother in, the, in, in Morocco and my grandmother had spoken another language and my aunt spoke another language and school was another language. So I had to learn three new languages in to survive, I guess. That's also a thing that it's, it's, um, it's an act of survival. And um, so I do, I, I do understand what happened. And the other thing, or I, I feel it. And the other thing that really, um, 
that I'm thinking of is that il my, my grandmother is illiterate, but she speaks three languages. So it's very interesting if you think about this period, the fact that these women couldn't write is of course a very, I don't know how, how you would call that, but um, I mean, how, how do historians and academics people like you Look at, the, look at that, because you don't have any documents, there are no archives, but these people existed, and they still exist. And somehow, I mean, how could we include them in our history? It's very painful for me to, to hear that, since I have lived with a grandmother like that, who traveled all around the world, who has seen so many countries speak three languages without knowing how to write, and has an iPhone which I'm really, that's like, that's, that's the part that I still don't understand, like. We, Voice we, memos are the, are the answer, right? Yes, <laughs> and, and video calling, yeah. but still she has to open it, there is a code, she has to look up for our names, and I, well, that's another story. But, uh, so this is my first reaction on what I heard, and, um, the official reaction would be a poem, right? <laughs> yeah, if you want. Yeah, please. Okay. So I will read the poem Tongue in Dutch. I'm really sorry, Eric, I don't have a translation. And um, there's another really nice detail because the Mediterranean is on my book, but upside down. It was a little bit hidden in there, but... <laughs> so, tong. En dit gaat over meertaligheid. Mijn moeder ontnam mij haar taal en zichzelf. Mijn kindertong werd overgeleverd aan harde kloosterklanken op veengrond. Geprevelde gebeden die altijd alles bezweren. Achtergebleven scheldpartijen van oude krijgsmachten, oude tekens op getatoeëerde kinnen van moeders, moeders, moeders. Sindsdien sleep ik het lot aan haar kruin achter me aan. In mijn kinderkeel werd een genadeloos pact gesloten. Een overeenkomst zoals die van gescheiden families omwille van het kind. Een samenzijn dat middelen heiligt uit de dagen dat ideale goden waren... Goden die beschermen als je waardige offers brengt. Offers zo gaaf als snijtanden. Ik heb gezwollen melk uit jullie talrijke borsten gedronken, zonder te weten wie werkelijk wie is. In mijn luchtpijp waanden jullie Nimrod in Babel. Laukuntu u'minu bimafhumil umuma, laukuntunna ummahati. De syntaxes werden op strakke bedjes naast elkaar gezaaid in mijn strottenhoofd. Jullie kerfde tekens in mijn stembanden, staken zwaarden in mijn gehemelte te rusten. Door mijn borstkas duwden jullie vleugels naar buiten voor een mogelijke exodus. In mijn mondholte herschiepen jullie wezens waarvan je de naam niet mag uitspreken. Hun scherp gekrulde iskiewen dreigde dagelijks mijn huig te verbannen. Hoeven vertrapten u en we en liefkoosde de je en de miem om hun vloeiende vormen. En aan mijn hoofd naaiden jullie oren vast, gekneed uit jullie tonen. Maar dit loer door wat gepromis. Verbanning heb ik afgeschaft en op mijn Tong vindt een orgie plaats. Mijn huig spuurt vuur in nood, terwijl mijn lippen zacht grenzen wegblazen. Germaanse sneeuwvlokken lossen op in oude semitische bergbastaards. Tomeloze huwelijken worden tussen mijn wangen gesmeed, glijden soepel als gepolijste kralen in een rozenkrans, keer op keer op keer. Mijn tong is gespleten. Uit trouw voor het noorden en het zuiden. Mijn moeder wordt oud en spreekt soms haar taal, die ik uiteindelijk toch leerde. 
van grootmoeders die de aarde te drinken geven voor ze zelf drinken. Actually, it's fascinating to read a poem in this context. Very fascinating. It, it, yeah, it's very, I guess it's a, in a sense a perfect sort of summary of, of this whole uh, talk. D did you get a sense of... Absolutely. Oh, great. Um, I am curious now in, if I um, can... Uh, How would you both think as historians to what Nithrin was saying about this sort of painful reality of... Uh, the lack. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's um, something that social and cultural historians, cultural historians interested not in high elite culture, but in a much more broader communal culture, are struggling with continuously, that uh, we miss the active voices of such a large uh, proportion, the, the majority. Um, and even when we hear them, it's very often through court records, so it's rarely in a good situation. And so we've been trained, I think, especially for the last 30 or 40 years or so, to read against the grain, as uh, jargony historians call it. So um, it's not really tegendraadslezen, but it's trying to make sense of the, the way, like the Justin Young quote, what does he write, why would he choose these words, what, what is he omitting, and so that's where the silences come in. But the reconst reconstruction effort is quite delicate and I kind of feel, I was struck, I'll give, give the mic to, uh, to Eric in a minute, but I, I'm struck by all uh, three contributions that um, age is very present or rather being a child and, and learning languages um, and that's even harder to, to f factor in the category of young age. Um, but also the physicality and, and the violence perhaps of um, The violence of the Dutch language is one thing, but also obviously the Mediterranean is not just uh, a region where interaction is peaceful and uh, co-creative, but quite violent as well. And women obviously uh, are on the receiving end, probably proportionately much more than men. So that's not really an answer, Zara, it's more questions. <laughs> Uh, I'll just uh, just chime in and say that, uh, I mean, I would love to meet your, uh, is it your grandmother that you said? Because this is, this is exactly sort of the, uh, she is the kind of the inspiration for the kind of history that I aspire to, but is, for all of the reasons that uh, Marcia explained, very difficult um, to, to achieve. There uh, it was uh, an English historian named E.P. Thompson who wrote a very famous, uh, a Marxist historian, writing in the 60s, but he wrote a very a famous uh, uh, history um, of the English working class, which he said he wanted to rescue from the enormous condescension of history, which uh, for me uh, was a, a very moving sort of, uh, of a manifesto, really, because I think, and it's not, it, it may be, I mean, there are all sorts of probably reasons for this condescension, um, Certainly, a part of that is the sorts of sources, as you mentioned, that, that we that we that we we're dependent on, and so language, by its very nature, is sort of ephemeral, right? It, it's spoken and it disappears, uh, and so if, as with uh, with your grandmother and with the vast majority of people in this time period who are illiterate, we really have. It's very difficult to get to those voices. It's difficult to sort of confront that condescension. But I think, it, I think it, we can't do it perfectly, but there are ways to, uh, to do that. And that's, that's sort of what I've tried to do uh, with this paper and with this project, is to find ways to sort of worm in. Um, uh, we'll never hear their voices directly because they aren't written down and they aren't uh, recorded, of course, for us, at least in this time period. But I think we can we can try to sort of make a gesture towards responding to that condescension that often um, is, uh, is the case. 
in these sorts of studies by trying to get to at, at least a, an echo of uh, of their lives and of their experiences. So, so this this is actually exactly what I'm trying to do with that uh, that that project. I was yeah, yeah yeah no I was wondering based on what you were saying and also Mark you saying that um, that reconstruction is is very delicate. Is there a difference? I mean, the Mediterranean is a huge uh, region, area, area. I don't know even if we can call it a region. Um, is there a difference? You had examples from all over the Mediterranean on whether it is easier or more difficult to find those uh, examples. Uh, is it different, for example, for the northern Mediterranean or more the southern Mediterranean and then northern Africa? So it is much more difficult, um, and, and part of this is uh, my own sort of limitations linguistically, um, because it is a space of incredible linguistic diversity. I don't know the ten languages that Clara Caterina de Hospier knew. Um, so there is that. But there are also sort of archival um, challenges that, that uh, influence this as well. And so, for example, in Ottoman archives, uh, incredibly rich, um, not unexplored, but still much to explore um, in these archives. But they preserve a certain, there's a, a certain kind of a, uh, of a documentary tradition, we might say, and a certain type of an archival tradition which determines what kinds of records are contained there. And so this sort of, there are certain stories that you can tell with those records very well, but this kind of story is not one of those stories. And so by necessity, my uh, documents, both my own limitations, but also I think archival realities have kind of determined um, that I'm using um, Italian sources, for example, and Greek sources, and Croatian, and Spanish, and sort of, so the perspective comes from that, uh, that angle rather than from sort of the Mediterranean um, bottom up. And I think that is a, 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 a limitation, a serious limitation, but one that's not easily overcome. So you have to learn Arabic. I suppose. Someone does, yes. <laughs> uh, the good thing about, I think, uh, interdisciplinary studies and, and, and regional studies like with the Mediterranean is it's a very collaborative sort of an undertaking. Even if I could learn those 10 languages to master the archives and the historiography would be several lifetimes <laughs> work. So, so it's a very collaborative sort of field in which I depend very heavily on mm -hmm. you know, Moroccan colleagues and Tunisian colleagues and Turkish colleagues and Greek colleagues. And, um, Which is nice, I can imagine. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, before uh, I, I raise all the questions, I am curious whether there are also questions from the audience. As I mentioned, don't be shy. Um, but if there are two... It's not a question. Can you wait one second? Because otherwise people at home cannot hear you. Yes. Uh, it's not a question, but I just wanted to adjust, like, um, my grandmother was born in Pira, in uh, Istanbul, and she spoke six languages, but she never went to school. But I think Atatürk, he, well, in the 30s, he started this program, schooling program, and a lot of women got more, uh, were more available going to school to learn. So it's still, uh, still going on. <laughs> I only speak five languages. <laughs> um, and there was another question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank all of you for the, for the wonderful contributions so far. I had a question for Eric um, in this project, uh, because as Marjo was saying, you're probably reading against the grain a lot, which is about the sources and about lack. And I was wondering to what extent uh, historiography that came after actually is something you have to work against, or in a sense that already what you mentioned about the public-private dichotomy, which is, one could say, more like a modern imagination rather than a pre-modern one, maybe. So I was wondering to what extent you're dealing with lacks and also with fullness in the historiographical sense? 
Um, yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And um, sort of an, an earlier stage of this project um, was uh, involved me sort of trying to think more broadly and kind of conceptually about, about um, this, this question of multilingualism, which was very much kind of in a response to a certain historiography, which tried to explain um, language in terms of intermediaries, which is a very important part of, of this story, to be sure. There are language specialists and culture specialists who are very interesting, dragomans, interpreters, and so forth. But it just seemed to me that that missed maybe most of the story, um, because um, the, the reality is, is that those individuals are few and far between, and most of the communication that I'm talking about happens in places uh, and in ways where they're not maybe even necessary if they are present. So a bit of it was sort of histori uh, this project is a pushing back against that histori uh, historiography. But there's also sort of, and you mentioned Ataturk uh, in your comment, there is, there is an ideology that is, uh, I think, very, very much informs our, uh, the, the way that we think about language um, today, which uh, ignores the, uh, and this is what ling sociolinguists have shown, is that there are almost no monolingual societies today even, but we have this powerful sort of nationalist narrative and, and sort of rhetoric, right? The nation is centered mm -hmm. like its breath almost, its heart and soul is language or was presented as, as such. And so, uh, and so uh, you know, I think that really distorts our, uh, has distorted our understanding of certainly probably contemporary history, which I don't study, but I think looking to the pre-modern period, the pre-national period, it's deeply problematic to try to sort of superimpose that kind of lens over a period which is not in any way sort of characterized by, by the, 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 ut the utopian, perhaps, kind of nationalist ideal of one language, one blood, one sort of people, which has never been the case. But it's, it's a powerful sort of, of an image. It's still mobilized, obviously, incredibly politically relevant still in our own day. This, this idea of, uh, or this idea of a sort of ideology of monolingualism. I'm curious to hear if yeah, it's a mouthful. Um, when I was reading your novel or your book of poetry, Nassim, um, I was struck by the fact that it had or it contains five languages because I indeed I never or almost never encountered uh, different languages within one book as in something else than English or or Dutch within one book. Uh, what do you, I mean, listening to Eric, and why did you decide to uh, use all these languages, and, and, and how do you think of this, uh, yeah, what, ideology of monolingualism? National ideology, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, National, yeah, yeah. Nationalistic yeah. ideology, because that's what it yeah. is. Um, well, actually, for me, um, it's very, very, very unnatural to talk in one language. So the most ideal situation is to speak in four or five languages and just switch and see what works out. And usually it works out very well. So the fact that I have to speak in one language um, is already... Um, how, how would I say that? It's forcing me to, to exclude my other languages, which are a part of me. So the more I write and the more I think about it is, um, the more I think about it, the more I come to the conclusion that it is a political ID. It's a not, it's not a, um, a, a socialistic ID. It's not a natural ID for me. It's, it's so unnatural to, 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 to talk in one language. And I think that's the reality of a lot of people these days. It used to be like that, but it's again, it, it's again uh, a reality of a lot of people that I have in my, in my life. 
uh, of course, because of uh, immigration, colonialism, all, all that kind of, of um, stuff. But actually, I never thought of writing a book in one language, because it, why would I? And, uh, but since it's my first poetry collection, I, <laughs> I did make a deal with myself that at least 90% would be Dutch. <laughs> because I am, I am a Dutch writer. I write, bas I, I write mainly in Dutch. I translate from Arabic and English, but I write in Dutch. But I, I could not exclude the other languages, so I had to, to, to do a lot of effort to not put a lot of other languages in the, um, in the um, collection. But I'm really trying to start a movement to write um, multilingual books. And um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not joking about that. And uh, fortunately, we have that opportunity in Holland. I speak with uh, colleagues, colleague poets in France or in England, and they find it much harder to convince a publisher to publish a book in two or three languages. And I think, well, if I can do it, other people can do it too in Holland. And I think that would enrich us in so many layers and yeah I mean it would also re represent who we are I mean I am a Dutch poet this is my language yeah we do it in music yeah I see some questions uh, in the back oh. to you thank you for the question yeah, I, I find it very interesting uh, that you have uh, this approach of, uh, um, well, that you incorporate several languages uh, in, in your collection of poetry. Uh, but at the same time, I'm thinking about uh, the uh, perspective of the reader, that wouldn't you also need multilingual readers then? Because how do you, how do you yeah, get the message across then? if you want to get a message across at all, but do you think about, or does the you or the publisher think about that? You know, do you add a glossary or something or not? Uh, I, I did something unconventional because at the end of my book, I didn't want any um, uh, Eintnote. Yeah, or, or glossary or Notes something. Or, yeah. yeah. So, the, and then I thought, okay, there might be readers who really want to understand the Amazigh and the Arabic, which are the hardest two languages. I mean, French you could look up. Yeah. And then I, I just wrote that you could check my website, but I have no website. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did that very, the, I mean, it's not a joke. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is kind of rebellious. Yeah. Just to find out how many readers are really interested in that 5% of the book that they don't understand. And actually only five people wrote me, like, ah, we didn't find your website, is it not online or can you... And I give them the translation because these are the people that really want to know. And then another reader uh, actually but just learned Arabic to translate the Arab word. So, but of course I think about that, but in this case, it's not much, and if you're really interested, you could find out. Yeah, but isn't that, yeah, maybe I'm, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a psychological thing I'm, I'm referring to now, but don't you, uh, you might want to create a feeling of exclusion? I mean, I'm no not, exclusion. No, because, because no. you have no idea what you're reading in, but, in Darija or in, in, in uh, Temesicht. And then sometimes you don't get, you know, the nuances you want to read. I think you're a very good reader. No, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's you know, if you, what you just read, your, your poem is beautiful, beautiful. But I get everything out of it because it's completely, well, yeah, it was completely in Dutch. I, 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 No, and it's right. There are a lot of people who can read Arabic. Yeah. 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 No, but it's a question. It's not any. It's not a, 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 a approach or anything. It's just a question. If you know, I'm, what's the psychology? Psychology. Yeah. If I may, uh, if I may interrupt, because I read it's about exclusion. I read it as well, and I, I mean, I don't read any Arabic, but 
I found it quite intriguing to read something or see uh, letters or something that I yeah. don't understand. I don't get that feeling either. I don't get the feeling. I don't. I don't. Then I don't think you will yeah. really have a problem. <laughs> No, I, no, okay. I, okay. Well, just, just, other and it was just so a I... question. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> implying anything here. Sorry if I did. Yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah. Yes, yes and, and indeed. So yeah. for the readers or the listeners at home, an invitation to... Actually, it's an opening. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. And it's yeah. the sound. And it's the sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question, and then I think we're going to uh, slowly wrap up but oh yeah just a response for your uh, one of your poems because uh, i relate to the japanese film which is draft my car that recently just won the oscar uh, international feature film where they use multilingual uh, actors who speak their own languages in the uh, theater of chekhov which audience will understand, only can look at the uh, subtitles, but the sounds and the particular emotions expressed by that certain language really move the audience. Even they use actors who um, use sign languages, which produce more like moving effects in the audience. So I think um, either it's written or it's oral, uh, like spoken out, I think they have profound impacts on the audience who only not speak uh, that language, yeah. yeah. So I think it's wonderful experimentation and could be expanded to more writers in the future. Yeah, I really yeah. hope so. One, one last question here on the, on the front row and then uh, that's it. No, it's more I want to say, I think Miss <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nisreen yeah. is being too modest. Sorry. <laughs> Nisreen is being too modest because the public is asking about like is it an invitation for us and you know for all the people who don't speak the language but what Nisreen did with this uh, this book is by choosing to write in all those languages is acknowledging that a lot of people in Holland live all these languages and you today didn't discuss about how do we value a language let me be honest, we value Western languages as better than we do with non-Western languages. So for me, same like Nisreen, growing up with all these languages inside of me, although Dutch is, Dutch is my first language, but how older I grow, how more I feel that I'm not complete without these other languages. So for a lot of people in Holland, her courage to write in all these languages is acknowledging that we exist and that in all, all these languages inside of us have an equal value. So thank you for that, Nisreen. Thank you so much. It, it, it really, I mean, yeah, it, it really is this. It's basically acknowledging, just as I explained in the beginning, I could not exclude a part of me. This is, I, it's, I mean, I have done that for such a long time and uh, I'm not willing to do that anymore. This is my place, this is what I do. I am a writer, I am a poet, I'm a translator. Basically my whole life is multilingual. So it would be so, so hard to not write or speak in several languages. And uh, that's why I said I'm really, I really hope that there are more writers, uh, artists, who are willing to explore that area and see if we could communicate in all these languages. And my experience is that it works very, very well. I can also imagine that if more people would write in, in several languages at the same time, this could also help historians from the future. <laughs> Um, to get a grasp on how language was used today. Um, maybe on that note, uh, I'll... I do have a question for Eric. Um, once said somebody to me, uh, when it comes to Arabic, it is better to learn it from a woman than from a man. So do you agree? And. Um, <laughs> I also have a question for uh, Nisreen. Um, 
for me as a poet, when you um, we live between many countries and identities and at the end you choose poetry as your own identity and it becomes your country, your um, home and at the end maybe your grave. Um, but um, what is the added value of using many languages in a poem? Um, what do you uh, want to, um, what is your goal of, of using these languages in a poem? I think the safe answer to your question for me is yes. <laughs> so, I'm going to just leave that right here in this company. <laughs> What is the added value of writing in several languages or in more languages? Um, it's basically um, being me. It's totally me. This is my product. I can, and actually, it's very funny because most um, sentences that are written in other languages are directly written in these languages. That's why I chose to put them in the book. Most of it, I mean, I think 90% of what I write is in Dutch, but sometimes I cannot, words come up or feelings or ideas come up in other languages and that's where I decided I will leave them like this. Like, there is a sentence and it, it says, um, um, <laughs> wait, <laughs> ma mère est une. Uh, attends, uh, wait just a moment. So it's also very, very tricky because once I start mixing languages, I really start mixing languages. So, dan kunnen we elkaar niet meer verstaan, misschien. Uh, ah ja, I remember. Ma mère est une boîte, uh, boîte vitesse vivante. It's just. I mean, I, I, did, I don't even know the word what vitesse en, en, en Hollande, in Dutch. It's, what I, it's, it's, it's how I wrote it down. And the same thing for other uh, words or sentences. Um, these are the first languages in which I wrote them, so I chose to leave them in that language. Yeah, that's okay, but you, know, you write for the public. Yes. Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. It's okay to not understand. I mean, I don't understand the world. I don't understand other people. I don't understand Hindi. That's too bad. But I still can enjoy it so much. <laughs> I want to I wanna thank you all. For those here, uh, please join us for a drink. Um, thank you, Eric, Martje. Nizreen, Lamia, uh, I've enjoyed it very much and um, I hope to see you all at the next NIAS talk on the 17th of May where we'll have a Dutch spoken <laughs> uh, talk on journalism and activism. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks.